Let's talk about the NMJ, which is not the naive Mongolian jugglers, nor the nervous multilingual jesters, nor the naked mischievous jackalopes. NMJ is the neuromuscular junction. It's where the nerve comes together with the muscle. So let's just kind of review. This is the synaptic knob. It's the end of a motor neuron. We have vesicles, little sacs, full of a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. A nerve action potential causes, the, in ways that we don't know yet, but we're going to see more about later, causes the vesicles to open and dump their acetylcholine into the synapse. It then will bind to acetylcholine receptors. And when it binds to the acetylcholine receptor, it takes two molecules of acetylcholine to bind to the receptor. It will then open the receptor. The receptor is actually a sodium channel. Sodium will flow through. I didn't put sodium in the diagram to keep it from getting too cluttered. Sodium will flow through the open channel and then create the muscle action potential, which will then go down the T-tubules, run alongside the terminal cisterns, open the calcium release channels. Calcium will come out. Calcium will then move troponin tropomyosin out of the way so the myosin head can attach the active filament. And then we do the power stroke and the muscle contracts, okay? So, um, in order to try to, and remember then also, acetylcholine, if it stays out here in the synapse, it will keep binding to the receptor over and over again. So when it binds to the receptor, and that's where we use bind, um, the receptor, it will open the receptor, and then the receptor will let go of it again. And the acetylcholine could then continue to float around and keep binding to the receptors. That means that once you contracted a muscle, it would stay that way for the rest of your life. And this might look cool, but it's going to be hard to get much done if you look like this all the time. So we have to have acetylcholinesterase, an enzyme that will gobble up the acetylcholine to prevent it um, from staying in the synapse and causing you to contract for the rest of your life. So let's look at some, uh, let's look at some ways to disrupt the neuromuscular junction. Sometimes you learn a lot how things work when you see how they don't work. So let's start by looking at nerve gas. Nerve gas is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. So think about that. Nerve gas, so molecules of nerve gas, once they get into your body, they are going to disable the acetylcholinesterase. They're going to cause it not to work anymore. And so what happens if the acetylcholinesterase doesn't work? the acetylcholine will now stay in the synapse. And therefore, it'll keep binding to the receptor over and over again, and all your muscles will lock up, all right? That produces something called spastic paralysis. Now, it'll cause a lot of other effects as well, because it'll work on your um, autonomic nervous system by um, activating cholinergic receptors. So it'll cause also all kinds of cholinergic effects including vomiting and all kinds of secretions and stuff like urinating, defecating, and so on. But it may also cause your muscles to lock up as well. So there you go. You can see how by, by just messing with acetylcholinesterase, all right, that keeps acetylcholinesterase from breaking down acetylcholine, and then it stays out here, and you cause a severe disruption. Nerve gases are very, very powerful tools. They've been used in wars. Um, after World War I, the countries involved all signed a treaty saying we're never going to do that again, but of course, new countries came along and countries changed their mind, and nerve gas is now uh, has been used again in recent wars, so it's a terrible thing. At any rate, that's nerve gas. <clears throat> Let's look at another type of toxin. Let's look at cobra toxin. Cobra toxin found in cobras. So what happens when you're bitten by a cobra? You have to do a lot to get a cobra pissed off enough to bite you, by the way, all right? Um, normally, cobras will run when they see a human. But if you seriously molest a cobra and it bites you, then the cobra venom gets into your body. And here's what cobra venom does. Cobra venom blocks the acetylcholine receptors, all right? So cobra toxin will block those receptors. So you're still, you know, the nerve action potential is still causing the release of acetylcholine. You're going to have plenty of acetylcholine. But what happens now? When acetylcholine tries to bind to the receptor, it's prevented from doing so. You can't, therefore, have any muscle action potentials 
can't travel down the sarcolemma, go down the T tubules, and so on and so forth, can't move troponin out of the way, therefore no muscle contraction. So what happens if you're bitten by a cobra? You end up with something called flaccid paralysis. By the way, I should have, for um, <clears throat> the uh, nerve gas, I should have written spastic paralysis. I forgot to do that. So flaccid paralysis. It means basically as you, and this, this is witnessed, if you, uh, I mean, this is well documented. People are bitten by cobras. A lot of uh, other snakes have this postsynaptic toxin. This is called a postsynaptic toxin because here's the whole synapse. We call this the presynaptic side of the synapse. This is the postsynaptic side. So cobra toxin is work, working postsynaptically to block the receptors. So the crates will do this as well. Um, very, very venomous snakes as well. Um, a variety of other venomous snakes will do that. They will work postsynaptically to block the receptors and therefore prevent transmission of the signal. So what happens is you're bitten by a cobra, you start getting weaker and weaker and weaker. You know, you can't stand up and pretty soon what's going to happen? Remember what's the big skeletal muscle keeping you alive right now? Your diaphragm. So what happens if the diaphragm doesn't work anymore? You stop breathing. Um, Joe Slovinsky was a very famous herpetologist who was in Thailand, I think. I can't remember. It was Burma. Um, but he, uh, he was bitten by a crate, and they were deep in the jungle, and they were out, kind of out of contact with uh, civilization. And um, they, uh, he knew he was uh, going to experience just exactly this, so the people who were with him, um, they ended up taking turns doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation to try to keep him alive as help was on the way. And it didn't work. He died before help, uh, help got there. So it really will do that. You won't be able to breathe and you'll die from respiratory failure. All right. So that's cobra toxin. Uh, again, same rag. I used to work on my truck. It's uh, double duty. Let's, um, let's try to fix the diagram here a little bit. That's the problem with this. You have to mark it up and then you have to fix it after you're done. Um, you yeah, have first world problems. Uh, so let me try to draw back again those um, acetylcholine receptors. We actually don't need them, I don't think, for this next example, but what the heck. Um, so yeah, so let's move on and talk about um, botulinum toxin. Cool stuff, huh? Botulinum toxin. And of course, you can go get injections of botulinum toxin, to toxic, I'd like to buy a vowel toxin, and of course they sell that as Botox. Um, it's the same thing. Botulinum toxin is the most lethal, most lethal toxin known on planet Earth. It has the lowest LD50, lethal dose for 50% 50 of, 50 of the population, of any toxin known. What they do is they just highly, highly dilute it, and they sell it as Botox. It's the same thing. Keep that in mind. There have been some accidents in which too much has gotten injected, and that can cause some serious trouble. But here's what Botox does. Botox is a presynaptic toxin, okay? So presynaptic toxin, what it does, Botox attacks the presynaptic membrane, all right? And it basically clogs it up so that no acetylcholine can get released. So in this case, what's going to happen? Well, the nerve ashram potential comes down, all right, comes down to the end of the motor neuron. No acetylcholine can get out. Therefore, no acetylcholine can bind to the receptors, and therefore what happens? Once again, flaccid paralysis. You can't move your muscles, all right? So, but notice, whereas uh, the cobra toxin also produced flaccid paralysis, the cobra toxin was a postsynaptic toxin, all right? Botox is a presynaptic toxin presynaptic because it is working on the synaptic knob, synaptic end bulb, terminal bouton side of the synapse so that no acetylcholine is being released, okay? So there you go. Um, isn't it cool how toxins work? This is toxicology, toxinology. Um, toxins are natural um, poisons, uh, but very cool stuff. And this, uh, historically, is a way that they learned a lot about how the neuromuscular junction worked. They actually used animal toxins. Most famous is tetrodotoxin, which is ultimately a bacterial toxin, but they found it in things like fish and the puffer fish. Um, so, 
At any rate, um, that's what's going on here. Botox, botulinum toxin, a presynaptic toxin, prevents acetylcholine from getting out. All right? Let's take a look at one more. You're going to have to fix the damn diagram here. But that's all right. Like I got better things to do. Okay, so let's uh, show some more of this acetylcholine then um, being released. All right, acetylcholine vesicles release the acetylcholine. Acetylcholine binds to the receptors, opens up the channels, creates the muscle action potential. Let's take a look at typoxin. Typoxin from uh, snakes called taipans. Taipans find in Australia and New Guinea. And the inland taipan generally um, considered to have the lowest LD50 of any snake toxin. The inland taipan, what, uh, remember Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter? He may be too young. But he always called the inland taipan the deadliest snake in the world. Um, and yeah, what happens if you're bitten by a taipan? You, uh, you, in taipoxin ends up in your system. This is called a PLA2 toxin, a phospholipase A2 toxin. So phospholipase, remember phospholipids are the uh, lipids that form the membranes around all cells in your body. Well, um, so those phospholipids are, are molecules held together at chemical bonds. And there are various names for the bonds. There's the A bond, there used to be the A, the B, the C, and then they decided that the B was actually a different type of A. I think that's the way it worked. You can look it up, check me out. So they started calling them A1 bond and the A2 bond. Then I think there's the C bond. At any rate, typoxin is a toxin that works by dissolving the phospholipase A2 bond. So what does that mean? That means that it breaks down the presynaptic membrane. So what happens is typoxin, you'll initially, the toxin will grab a hold of the presynaptic membrane, all right, and when it does that, it will temporarily prevent any acetylcholine from getting released. It basically just globs it over. Acetylcholine can't get out. So what's going to happen? You'll start with an initial flaccid phase because there won't be enough um, acetylcholine getting to the receptors to cause the muscles to contract. Um, but then what happens is, as the toxin continues to work, it completely eats away the end of the membrane. Then it starts to eat away all of the vesicle membranes as well. And so what happens next? You get massive amounts of acetylcholine dumped into the synapse, all right? And what happens now? Basically, all your, uh, I mean, there's still acetylcholinesterase, but you're getting so much acetylcholine out here that it's doing a lot of binding to the receptors, and so it's doing a lot of activation of muscle contraction. So then you go into a phase of spastic paralysis, where all your muscles are starting to contract, all right? But then what happens next? Well, acetylcholinesterase is still out here, so it starts eating up all of the acetylcholine, and since you dumped all your vesicles, you now don't have any more vesicles because they all got eaten away. And so now you go back to a stage of flaccid paralysis. So they call it a triphasic pattern. It'd be awesome if you were bitten by a type out. Now you know what's happening. You know, after the bite, you'll start feeling weak and you'll go, okay, yeah, it's eating away the phospholipid bilayer. Then you're gonna start to, if you didn't know, this would be tragic, wouldn't it? Because you'd be thinking, oh my God, I'm going to die. And then suddenly you'd start feeling better. you go, oh, okay, I guess it's not so bad after all. And then you'd start to twitch and spasm. You'd think, oh my God, I'm going to die. And then eventually that will go away. And you think, oh, okay, so I really am going to be better. Um, but in this case, you're not. You're just going to get weaker and weaker until you die. Cool, huh, kids? Go to Australia, catch a taipan, bring it back to class. I'll give you extra credit, okay? So there you go. Some toxins working at the neuromuscular junction.